every great boss out there, for every encounter that we hold near and dear to our hearts and keep in the backs of our minds, there always has to be that one. The one that just takes you out of the enjoyment and throws you into this sub-state where you end up in a limbo that only ends after 10 failures and the game arbitrarily lets you pass the velvet rope to let you loose on the rest of the game. The following are the 10 worst examples of either bad concepts, stupid combat, character failures, and or abysmal implementation from the year of 2014. Now, as with my other top 10 list from this year, these are only going to be bosses from games I've played this year, and every boss has gotten a fair shake from me when being considered for this list. So without further ado, let's get started. <laughs> My god, we've just started and already I have to throw up the flame shield. My number 10 worst boss fight of 2014 is Metal Gear Rex from Metal Gear Solid. Oh, I can hear the keys are tapping already. Yes, I did not like Metal Gear Rex, even in the slightest. The buildup for this battle was great. Liquid Snake was a great villain with an intriguing concept, but what absolutely kills this for me is the fight itself. Metal Gear Rex is a Godzilla battle with the trope turned upside down with this battle being the realistic depiction of what would happen if you pitted up a giant beast versus a small person in comparison. It actually fucking hurts, and Solid Snake is in for 12 worlds of pain. The problem with this fight is entirely found within the scale of the two combatants, and since Rex is this giant mech, it makes it incredibly easy for it to fire off back-breaking attacks since it has such a wide range, and only adding to this fight's issues is the weakness weapon of Metal Gear Rex. Now, in most instances of Metal Gear characters fighting things that are bigger than they are, this is the point in the game where they are gifted the Stinger Rocket Launch. And this thing is about as overpowered and unwieldy as it possibly can, with Solid Snake being literally unable to move when he's aiming this monstrosity, and combining the weakness weapon not being able to move with the large range of Rex's weapons, you have a recipe for disaster with fights that can be won or lost with a margin of error spanning one or two seconds. Not only that, but in this arena you are allowed one health item, possibly two if you look around, and even worse than that is that this arena has no cover. Sure it has a couple of boxes around, but Rex's missiles and lasers can cut through it like nothing. The weaknesses on Rex's body are also incredibly small, adding to the frustration when a stinger needs time to lock onto one of the smallest parts of Rex's body. And finally, this thing is all done in a top-down perspective in this small arena, making it just that much more difficult to aim when you go into first person and take the damn thing down. This fight is an unfortunate downfall for one of the most iconic elements of the entire franchise, since a lot of mechs in future games take their appearance from the defeated Rex, but I can't feel anything but contempt for this one, since you are guaranteed at least 10 deaths before you get lucky enough to get all the strikes in, since this thing has two phases with no checkpoint in between. This fight was what the entire game was building up to as well, which makes it all the more disheartening. Well, I've already made myself depressed on our first contender. Hopefully the rest of the list will at least give me a freaking break. The next contender on this list is from an entry to the series that never seems to get much attention, and I can find reason in that since this game was a console exclusive and never released on any subsequent collection discs. Mostly because it had horrible controls and a lackluster story compared to other entrants, but it does house one of the worst bosses I've faced this year, and that would be Python from Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops. Since this game was a PSP exclusive, its production values were exceedingly cut down. The story's lost much of its dimensionality, the objectives were incredibly flimsy, the added controls are just fiddly and overall useless for how much complexity they have, and the boss fights are pretty bad despite only having seven, and this one is undoubtedly the worst of the bunch. This fight features a character straight out of left field who was given his entire story tied to Big Boss's character which does not at all work because we've never seen this guy before. If this guy's backstory was standalone, it would have largely been improved because this fight is like the creepy stalker who's invented this entire life involving another person who they've never met before. Sure, the story says that Big Boss and Python are old members of the same troop fighting in Vietnam, but players have never seen this guy before, so they're putting effort into having a characterization encounter without introducing this guy at any time before now. Fortunately, that's actually one of the better aspects of this guy. He has some sort of reason to have an axe to grind against Big Boss because after his pre-fight cutscenes, things start falling downhill extremely fast. The main problem with this fight is that because of Python's abilities, you're actually fighting him in a freezer. This has nothing to do with anything other than Python's self-preservation instincts, since his body needs to be cold or he dies due to a battlefield injury. 
Otherwise, it's a straight gunfight until one of you falls over. The problem is that due to this being a freezer and all, visibility is reduced to about 3 feet, and that means 99% of the time Python is shrouded in mist. Thankfully, the targeting system can keep a grip on the guy, but if you can't find him, then you'll be shot up and lose one third of your health before you can say Uncle Sam. Yes, Python is armed with a machine gun that can destroy your health if you're not careful, and since Python has such a huge health bar, this is your standard, terrible, high HP, high damage boss that leads to a multitude of deaths completely due to the Silent Hill bullcrap they decide to shove into this fight for really no reason. If the fog wasn't completely hogging the entire fight, then it could have been a lot better, especially if they cut the backstory from Big Boss altogether, but the main disappointment to this fight is that it's not worth killing this guy. He goes down quietly and he's never heard from again. You couldn't have given me any sort of payoff for my 7 lost lives? Well fuck this fight then as a nonsense difficulty spike that shouldn't have been in this game. <laughs> I was able to find three bosses from this game that blew my socks off and made me want to come back and revisit the fights time and time again because of their intense, realistic gameplay and great additions to the overall story of the game. Could you believe that I found three more that I absolutely hate? Well, let's start off with another one of the most famous bosses from that game, because number 8 belongs to none other than Bossaron from Shadow of the Colossus. This boss comes to us from a location that we've already walked across to get to a different Colossus in this game when I was wondering what they were using this field of geysers for. Too bad the answer to that question is something I never wanted to see. Bossaron falls straight into the category of shitty idea meets terrible implementation. The core concept of this fight is that Bossaron, that giant turtle over there, has to be defeated by baiting him to stand over geysers when they fire in order to flip him over and hit his weak spots. The unfortunate thing for Wander is that every core mechanic in this game is hell bent on making that nearly impossible. First problem, the camera. Now, Shadow of the Colossus may be known for its artistic stance and great battles, but one thing it's also known for is its camera makes doing anything with precision as arduous and stupidly annoying as possible. And since Bossaron has to be fought on top of Argo, where most of the camera issues take place, you'll find out quickly that even the slightest tap on the camera control will have the world spinning around rapidly while you're trying to precisely land Bossaron straight onto a geyser, which, by the way, have a chance of not working, even if you hit Bossaron straight on, because not only do you have to precisely hit Bossaron, you also have to have a precise time of geyser liftoff in order to get the guy on his back. I doubt that more than two seconds of QA testing was ever put into looking at the Bossaron fight, because the only way you'll be able to do damage to Bossaron is when the game just decides that Bossaron can be defeated. Oh, and he shoots lightning. Because that's fair! One of the worst things you can peddle to a player is a concept that ends up being a glitchy waste of time than something that can enhance what has already been added to the game. I hate gimmicks as much as the next guy, but the only thing worse is a broken gimmick. Alright, who's next? <laughs> Bossaron is an idea that could have worked if it was looked at QA. Python and Rex could have worked if the bullshit was removed entirely. But the number 7 entry on this list falls into the trap of requiring the use of a skill that was never explained at all. And that erroneous honor falls straight at the feet of Colonel Vulgin from Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. Now, I hate this guy. I really do. He's annoyingly self-righteous, and his sadistic character makes me want to punch him in the face. But what I hate most about Vulgin is that he's grade A generic villain material. His motivations are as bog standard as hell, which was probably just trying to take over the world using the Shagohot as his trump card. While hating the character right off the bat can work for some boss fights, here it just puts more salt and vinegar into the wound because this fight is the first of the CQC fights of MGS3. Think Jetstream and Armstrong's fights from Metal Gear Rising, except remove the introduction of Perry from the entire game. This is the reason why I hate all the added mechanics of Metal Gear Solid 3, from the CQC fighting all the way down to the food system, because absolutely nothing is explained to the player of how to use these systems. Sure, we're told that we can do these things, but we're never given the how, the important part. The fight only gets more exasperating when you realize that while you can't use projectile attacks due to Vulgin's electrical field, he can still attack you with a gun-based attack, leaving us fighting an overpowered enemy with only melee attacks that the player doesn't understand. 
Sure, you can look up on a wiki how to use these mechanics. Personally, I had to in order to figure out where food was, but that's inexcusable. If you're gonna base boss fights around mechanics, then you need to fucking establish them to the player. Otherwise, THIS HAPPENS! What do you want? The fight's a freaking disaster, which isn't helped by the game thinking that ammunition for guns we can't use against this electrically powered sadist is helpful. It's head-bangingly frustrating since he has about seven different ways to attack you, all of them painful as crap, and you really only have one card up your sleeve that barely functions. That's all there is to this guy. Terrible character and a shitty fight, but Volju was such an awful person that it really allowed Major Ossot to form into an intriguing person, especially when he's helping out here. Four down and six to go. Let's keep this downhill spiral rolling, rolling, rolling. What could be worse than an electrically powered maniac with delusions of grandeur only being defeated using a weapon we were never told about? How about an incredibly drawn out battle with an enemy that can dish out one third health bar damage every three seconds? The special today, for a limited time, is Raging Raven for Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots. This fight will make you break blood vessels. Yep, we're getting into heavy hitters now. This fight starts rather well and actually gets some build-up with Solid Snake and Eva's caravan being assailed by the flying drones under Raging Raven's care, but they manage to avoid the shots just enough to duck inside an abandoned three-story apartment building where the fight starts proper. After that, we are treated to one of the most unbalanced fights in freaking existence. This, for lack of a better term, total bitch has 10 to 20 of those flying drone things at the very start of the battle, which is used for two reasons. One, added a player annoyance to the pile that Raging Raven already gives us, and two, to use as Raging Raven's disguise because guess what? She's up there with the group as well, which means you have to play guess who on top of getting your ass blasted off every three seconds. I'm not kidding. All the time throughout this fight, you have to worry about Raging Raven coming in off screen and bomb running an entire hallway in this three story building. Yeah, she has fucking missiles on her back that she can fire off an entire magazine's worth and blast you to bits, losing half your health before you can even react to it. Suffice to say that finding decent cover is going to be invaluable for even having a chance at surviving this hell. Now, this by itself isn't what makes the fight an atrocity. It's doing that, but also giving your boss an insane amount of defense. During my play of this fight, I was able to snipe her directly in the face, and it only took off a sliver of her health bar. From a sniper shot to the face! This fight will take you about 40 minutes on just your winning attempt due to the fact that she's able to dish out insane amounts of damage and basically tank all the damage that's coming to her. It's like trying to destroy a brick wall with a plastic spoon. I'm sure that she has some sort of weakness that I just didn't use in order to make this a hell of a lot easier, but hiding behind that excuse is bullshit because a great boss will take alternate paths of logic into account and manage to translate that information to the player about what works and what doesn't which some of Mega Man's Robot Masters didn't seem to understand. And when a way to go is this frickin' illogical, I can't see much good coming out of this fight. And to make matters worse, there is absolutely no payoff for the hell that this fight puts through the player because after Raging Raven's taken down, she crashes into the building and abandons her jetpack for that same stupid and unnecessary beauty fight that are just there to fill space because there is no sense in having a boss's phase be melee focused in a cover based shooter. Back away from her and shoot her for 30 seconds and you win. It's lazy, incompetent, and serves no purpose whatsoever. I'm done here. Let's just move on. <laughs> So, Raging Raven's battle script failure wasn't good enough for you? Then let me introduce my number 5 pick for this list, Phaedra from Shadow of the Colossus. This fight comes in between the spectacular fights with Gaius and Avian, so you would usually expect that this fight would be pretty good quality wise. And you'd be wrong. Ludicrously wrong. This fight is even more of a battle script failure than Raging Raven. Yes, it's that bad. This battle starts by Argo and Wander running to the back of the battlefield where the kneeling Phaedra can be found and obviously it's a giant horse colossus. Now all colossi in this game have one specific gimmick that must be used in order to get onto the boss in question. With Gaius it was the whole disc stabbing trickery, with Pelagia it was steering the boss itself, and with Phalanx it was the horse run jump wing event. How do we get on Phaedra? Well, the core idea of this fight is to use the underground passages in the battlefield to trick Phaedra to look for you so you can jump on its back. 
The concept was good on paper, but where it falls apart is in implementation. First is the issue that arises from none of the information being telegraphed to the player. The Light Spirits' hint is vague as crap and basically amounts to the same tricky Phaedra thing that's been done about 12 times with no idea of what to do. I have absolutely no shame in admitting that I had to use the internet to figure out what the hell I was doing here because apparently what we were supposed to be doing was tricking Phaedra into a specific position so the armor on his ass would dip just low enough to be within our maximum jump distance and then we could get on him. I'm sorry, game, that I didn't instantaneously realize that the Phaedra butt armor that's been slightly out of my reach for the last 10 fucking minutes was where I actually needed to start climbing this thing. No, you need to give the player adequate signs of success when you do this, and making Phaedra walk around all day until he's in a specific position just to jump on the absolute lowest stone on his body is not how you do it. If this is the puzzle that you think of for your boss fight, then send it back to the drawing board because this fight is a purebred example of how that can fuck up the game altogether. Phaedra didn't have to be this bad of a fight. Hell, with the Horse Colossus, the limits of the other fights could have been outright destroyed. Here's a better idea. Keep Phaedra asleep until Wander climbs on him, then when he gets the first stab in, Phaedra wakes up and just bolts into the overworld trying to buck Wander off. If he falls off, then give him some accessible cliffs so that he can get back on, maybe even allow the bow to make him bash at the wall in anger, giving him an opening. See, horses can make great enemies, you just have to work with what you've got, and making Phaedra a stupid dumbass that spent all of his fight looking for you gorgeously in holes in the ground is like being given a soccer ball, and instead you use it as a paper weight. Phaedra had potential and you just had to completely destroy it. Thanks for that. Just thanks, Team Ico. It's time. From here onwards, these were the clear and undoubtable winners of All My Rage this year. The last six were interchangeably bad, and I had to really think about where they should be placed on this list. But not these next four. They are rotten straight to the core, and who'd have better to start off the worst of the worst than the worst boss in Shadow of the Colossus, Solosia. Solosia is at the part of the game where I'm sure Team Ico were just running out of ideas. I mean, Phaedra and Barba had some signs of that too, but at least there was Avian and Hydras around balancing that out. No, Solosia is the clear sign that Team Ico just gave up halfway through development. Because what did they decide to put in as the 11th boss in a series only about giant monsters? They put in a bull. They put in a fucking stone-faced bull. Gwah! Honestly, Team Ico, what the fuck? We've been fighting giant swordsmen, elephants the size of bomber aircraft, and freaking sea monsters, and you decide to give me this? In a game famous for its scale and giant monsters, you decide right in the middle to have a bull. Not a giant, nonchalant, crashing through mountains for shits and giggles bull, but a, just a regular one made of rock. You know what's funny? Its design is the least of my anger. No, what takes the fucking rage cake in this Solosia battle is its completely nonsense battle script. This fight starts on a stone platform surrounded by fire-holding statues with a stick somewhere around here that water can grab it since the light spirits is hit and reveals that fire is Solosia's weakness. We grab it and then... Um, okay, now what? Once again, the game doesn't tell us what's going on. We have a stick and a bull and no freaking clue of how the two come together. Well, after 10 minutes of confusion, eventually the answer sticks out as the side of the arena that has no edge on it. Solosia falls down and reveals its weak spot when the ground cracks its armor. You'd think that Solosia would have been weakened by that fall and possibly staggering, right? Well, no, that would be the sensible thing to do, but instead we get this. Solosia is running around the field like a runaway criminal with its ass on fire, and if you don't get on this thing, then you are guaranteed a world of hurt when Solosia decides that Wander's face would look a hell of a lot better if it had a big ol' imprint of his armor on it. Without that extra armor, Solosia is stupidly fast, and it actually gets five times worse when you're riding Solosia. Solosia's movements are so erratic and quick that you'll only get about five seconds at best to build up energy for the stab, and you can barely do damage to Solosia this way unless you are in a specific body position on Solosia's back that allows you to charge up more than a small poke when riding on it. Then we get to the fun part of the fight when Solosia brings you back to the cave's trench because if you aren't on top of Solosia, this is the part of the fight where Solosia decides to just steal half your health bar. 
See, if you're tackled by Solosia, then the game holds you to the ground for a couple of seconds before allowing you to get up, and by that time, Solosia already has another tackle ready for you. Yes, because of this location's tightly packed walls and dumbass stunlock timing, Solosia can actually hit you multiple times for big damage, because the game stands you up just in time for Solosia to be running at you with perfect precision timing. This boss is the absolute worst that this game has done, and I've never heard a word of good coming from its players. I can bloody well see why that's the reality of this guy. From abysmal concept to dumbass combat, an unfair difficulty that spikes in having the game itself literally let you up for failure, everything about this boss is wrong with a concept that should have never made it out of the starting gates. <laughs> When someone says that they hate a particular game, it's rare that they'll say that it had a redeeming feature that kept them interested, and the punchline for this is Queen Blank from Ico. I didn't like Ico. Nothing in it was interesting, and it was creatively bankrupt from the get-go. Sure, the set pieces are different colors, but this game is just a horribly extended Zelda dungeon with a particularly well-done story involved for one. But as a game story, it's horribly cliché with no ambitions to make it better. Its wiki page says that it won awards based on it being a subversion on the princess rescuing plot, and that its simplicity is what makes the game great. I don't know what kind of game those guys were playing, but this game is just the princess rescuing plot. It's not a subversion, it's only a slight variation. The game is boring, bland, has no characters to itself, and what better way to end such a shit game with a terribly anticlimactic boss fight? Now, this game had three characters, period. Iko, Wander Dormant's magically cursed demon baby from the end of Shadow of the Colossus, Yorda, some sort of white-skinned girl with alien powers the same as the soldier's sword, and the Queen, which I call Queen Blank because the game didn't actually name her, who is Yorda's mother using her for her own selfish needs, and a motivation stolen from Orochimaru. This fight comes at the very end of the game. Does the final boss, where else would it be? When Aiko had escaped the castle without Yorda and invaded back inside in order to get her back, where he found the soldier's sword, which was the weapon that the soldiers were using to open the gates in order to imprison Aiko at the beginning of the game. With this weapon he found half an hour ago, Aiko can now take on Queen Blank for the life of Yorda, and it fails in almost every category. This fight isn't fun. It's not even compelling or for the most part interesting. It's got the Liquid Snake fight problem of having the checkpoint activate right before the boss battle, meaning that there's absolutely no consequences for failure, and the fact that Queen Blank has only one attack that she spams constantly means that it's horribly formulaic along with the fact that the attack is an insta-kill and neutralized just by holding the soldier's sword. The only threat in this game is that when the soldier strikes her shield, it goes flying to a random point in the room, meaning that you're defenseless for a short while while you get it back. Another thing this fight does wrong is that it doesn't translate that hitting her in the shield is actually dealing any damage, since in many other cases when an enemy being fought is shielded, you generally have to figure a way to either remove or circumvent the shield, but in this case we're just supposed to assume that this shield is taking damage when it looks more like it's just absorbing the damage, and the player feels like they're doing something wrong. Nope, the fight really is that stupid. Just wail away at Queen Blank and you'll just win. The fact that she dies in four hits makes this fight only a slight step up from the QTE final boss boss fight in Halo 4. However, there is a slight redemption to be found in this fight, and that has to be the gruesome Queen Blank death, where Aiko impales Queen Blank through the chest with his massive sword, and to tell you the truth, it was incredibly cathartic because this conniving bitch has been toying with the player arbitrarily throughout the game, making us go through the entire castle twice just because she teleported in out of nowhere. Hell yeah, that felt good. So, who's next? <laughs> Boy, I'm not making any friends with this choice. I'll just have to pull about three flame shields for this one. I just fucking hate every little damn thing about the fight against the boss from Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. There, I said it. The boss is my number two worst boss fight of 2014. Let me put things into context before I get any rage comments. Now, the boss is the character that everything in MGS3 revolves around. She's the leader of the Cobra unit, it's her actions that put strain on America and the Soviet Union rivalry, and the actions of the Cobra unit under her care has led them to kidnap Sokolov and take the Shagohod for their own personal gains. She's also the person who trained Big Boss to be what he is, and also the person who betrayed him. And even though before this we had destroyed Colonel Vulcan and the Shagohod who were the spearheads of the whole terroristic plot, we still have to go out of our way to deal with the boss because I don't know. There's absolutely no prompting for this other than, she's there. 
The pre fight cutscene tries its damnedest to pull on the audience's emotional heartstrings while also trying to tie the compact and impenetrable mess that is her purpose in the plot all together in a nice bow. She finishes her monologue by saying that because of the mission, we are required to have a duel to death with her. Yeah, I'm not buying this. Why? Well, one, she's not thinking rationally anymore. She's standing there jabbering on about a bunch of different things that all come together to sound like a final word speech, meaning that she really believes that this is her final act, and two, she could have easily left the situation and have lived a full life in seclusion from the world's eyes if she so chose to. But instead, she's manifested into her military idealism and has called for the fight that she believes will be her last. People I've talked to about this always tell me that the counterpoint to this issue I have with the fight is that if the boss had been allowed to live, then the Soviet Union would have been prompted by the national betrayal to start a war against America, despite the fact that the stolen scientist has been rescued and the nuclear weapon has been removed. No, the Soviet Union is not insane enough to be looking for a war that hard, that all they need to justify is the life of one particular mercenary. Then there's the purpose of her in the plot. Honestly, I've thought about her story a bunch of different times, and I still don't have it completely together. Because of reasons, the CIA deemed the boss too much of a threat to their well-being because of her popularity amongst all mercenaries, and so in order to take her out of the equation, they orchestrated a final mission for her that entailed all of her actions in Metal Gear Solid 3, and the final predicted outcome of this is that Big Boss, her student, would be able to kill the Soviet defecting the boss so that they won't have to. So basically, she was told to defect to the Cobra unit because of reasons, and for a final objective I didn't see come to fruition. You tried to do an incredibly elaborate story full of deep meaning and undercover conspiracies, and all you ended up doing was making the boss the manifestation of a story that had no hopes of ever making sense. That's not even my main problem with this fight, and unfortunately, it's the same exact note as Colonel Vulgin. It's another CQC-required battle, and the skills to use that system are still never explained, leading to a battle that's decided entirely on luck, since both characters are required to use melee attacks, and both the computer and the game to use CQC attacks have to press a button simultaneously when they meet, and whoever ends up hitting the ground is entirely up to a random number generator. Just a general note for any boss fight, you never want to base the entire fight on core mechanics that are used only for that fight. They're annoying, gimmicky, and lead to a situation similar to taking any random Joe off the street and requiring that they use highly advanced equipment to create seamless flight plans for a hundred different aircraft. It's a foreign system that we don't understand and now you're having us take down one of the biggest threats in the game with it. This never works. If you had just a tutorial on CQC techniques, then this fight could have worked a lot better. Even just a short practice run of the combos added to the combat was all that could have been needed, but since it was never explained and the story surrounding the fight is complete nonsense being spewed out from a woman that has lost all her humanity, that is why the boss's fight from Metal Gear Solid 3 is one of the worst experiences that I've ever had the displeasure of being involved with. And to think, there's still one more left. For someone to have been the worst of this year, it had to be the one that combined a dumbass concept, stupid design, terrible setup, and a cataclysmically bad story surrounding it all while using fiddly and unintuitive controls that make controlling a nuclear submarine on the first day seem like a cakewalk. And just like my top 10 list for this year, I had to go with the obvious choice. The worst boss that I fought in 2014 was the infamous final standoff with Solid as Snake from Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. The first time I bring up this entry in the franchise and it had to be because it housed one of the worst bosses in gaming history. Now, the boss committed every sin that this fight did, but at least there was a point to her character and it could have worked in some semblance of reality. Raging Raven is just as obtusely difficult, but at least there was some levity from damage and the controls worked. The Solidus Snake fight has no redeeming features. It is an inexcusable pile of trite and failed ideas that baffles everybody that plays it of how this fight came into existence. Everything it does is wrong. It has pulled out every bad boss design card in existence. Lackluster story, terrible controls, gimmick core mechanics, difficulty spikes, unfairly overpowered enemy. What a clusterfuck. The first problem is the boss himself. Solidus Snake was the obvious final boss for this game by the way he was leading Dead Cell and pretending to be Solid Snake, which could have worked if Solid Snake himself wasn't in the supporting cast for this game and in the scene where he was pretending to be him. 
And even though he's the third product of the Less Than Fence to Reblip project and the direct clone of Big Boss, he decides to do nothing with it. Yeah, this guy is about as bog standard as villains go with just generic visions of world conquest. The only interest that there is in this fight is that Solidus Snake is actually the target of a Patriot strike down orchestrated by Raiden. During the last half hour of this game, the codec characters we've relied on for the last 15 hours have started to turn into malfunctioning robots that have been spouting complete nonsense where they reveal that... Oh, wait. First some spoiler warnings for the main plot of MGS2. Okay, I think we're clear. They revealed that the entire Big Shell incident was actually just a test for the Patriots to see if they could manipulate mercenaries to do exactly what they wanted. Measure the effects of their training systems and it worked out perfectly. Then they order Ryan to take out Solidus Snake, finalizing the operation, and unfortunately Ryan is forced to do this because they landed on Liberty Hall's roof for their final punch-up. Well, Kojima was forced to remove the crash scene that would have explained this due to 9-11 fears. Thanks, rest of the world. Anyway, this leads me into the fight's next problem, the completely new core mechanic that we now have to deal with. While still in Big Shell, Ryan was given a high-frequency sword by Solid Snake. I don't really know why, but thankfully we did get it because in the crash we lost all of our other items other than the sword. So now we have to use sword fighting mechanics for the first time against the final boss of the game. If the boss wasn't enough to show you how terrible introducing new core mechanics into the game right at the end, this one should seal, pack, and mail the deal straight into your frickin' brain. The sword fighting controls are unacceptable. There's absolutely no feedback to tell you if you're dealing damage with it, and it doesn't stagger Solidus, which allows him to strike you heavily while you're getting damage on him. So thanks to that, if we ever want to hit Solidus, then we need to fear a counterattack just by getting close to him. And if it wasn't that bad enough, then we have to deal with Solidus himself, who is incredibly overpowered since he has access to several ranged attacks and projectiles, along with his most devastating attack, the Redfoot Shuffle, where he sets about half of the battlefield on fire, and more than likely yourself. But you better get used to it, because when he's at half health, that attack is firing off twice every minute, so you'll be on fire. A lot. This fight is terrible from up and down, left to right, and side to side, with everything it does being a fast track to Frustration Avenue population 300 broken controllers. The story sucks. The core mechanics of the game are changed entirely for this one fight, only that it doesn't work with unintuitive controls and zero feedback. The enemy attacks are just there to beat the player into the ground, and the final death of this guy isn't even satisfying, because all he does is lose his balance and then fall about 10 feet into a trash can. Really, he uses two swords, a tentacle-armed backpack, and fucking flaming shoes. And that's all we get. A fall into a trash can. This boss fight is the black stain on the otherwise greatly cared for cloth that is the Metal Gear franchise. Something that no one wanted and the series didn't deserve. I have no doubt that this fight was just crapped out right at the end of production before they were forced to cut things from the game in order to meet the deadline because I couldn't imagine a QA team in existence that would have wanted this train wreck cataclysmic disaster to hit store shelves. It's abysmal, universally disappointing, and the absolute worst that the series has gotten, and it's no surprise that this one ended up at the bottom of the barrel for this year. I just hope that next year picking the bottom 10 will be a lot harder, but we won't know that until I start reviews again, so thank you for watching, and as always, I'll leave you with a victory for gamers.